And our second scripture reading comes from the book of Job, chapter one, verse one, and then chapter two, verses one through 10. There was once a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job. That man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. One day the heavenly beings came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. He still persists in his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him for no reason. Then Satan answered the Lord, skin for skin, all that people have, they will give to save their lives. But stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well, he is in your power, only spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and inflicted loathsome sores on Job from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. Job took a, a, a potsherd with him to scrape himself and sat among the ashes. Then his wife said to him, do you still persist in your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, you speak as any foolish woman would speak. Shall we receive the good at the hand of God and not receive the bad? And all this, Job did not sin with his lips. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let us join our hearts in prayer. Gracious God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts might be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So I need a, a, a sermon example when it feels like everything is just working against you. It's not one thing, it's not two things, it feels like everything. You don't feel safe. Loved ones are ill, others have died. You can't get together with friends. You can't even gather for worship in person. There's no harmony on the streets or in our hearts. Our relationships are strained. Some are coming apart at the seams. Your income is non-existent or has been affected adversely. And now your own health is compromised. You know, a Job-like experience. Can anybody think of anything? I remember praying at one point uh, during this COVID experience, something happened and I prayed, Lord, it was already enough. It was already enough. And then the next thought was how many people are experiencing the exact same things? And then my next thought was how are they doing this without faith? That's the question of Job. How do we respond to life, to God when we suffer? The book of Job does not answer the question why we suffer. The book asks us, how do we respond to God when we do? So let's back up. The passage we read uh, comes from chapter two. Chapter one is the first test of Job to see how he responds to to suffering by losing everything, income, his children, and his wife is left to say, all right, Job, just curse God and die. Thanks, honey. <laughs> well, let's, let's back up even a little more. We need to recognize that the book of Job is not historical. It's, it's a story. It even starts like a fairy tale. There once was a man in the land of, I want to say Oz, right? But it's, it's Uz, U-Z, whose name was Job. Uz is not a real place. The Hebrew word Uz means counsel or advice. So this is wisdom literature. We could say that in the land of counsel, there was a man who was very pleasing to God. And God has this conversation with Hasatan, Satan, not to be confused with the devil. In Jewish understanding at the time of writing, of, uh, in the time of writing, Satan or the adversary was considered a person 
a thing or a set of circumstances that constitutes an obstacle or frustrates one's purposes. The adversary is a servant of God. And God rags on Job and the adversary reasons, well, it's because he has everything. What does he have to complain about? Of course he loves you. Take away all his stuff and he will curse you with his lips. So poof, the stuff is gone. And yet Job proves faithful. Now here in chapter two, the adversary reasons, well, if you, if you inflict personal suffering to, to his body, then he will reject you. And again, Job refuses to curse God with his lips or disavow his faith in God. So then Job, continuing on in the story, has some friends who come over and sit with him in the ashes and they're silent for a very long time, which I think is brilliant. But in their silence, they're trying to make sense of it. Why would all of this happen to Job? And then they decide to speak. Paraphrasing. You've got three choices, Job. You can either hate yourself, you can hate other people, or you can hate God. Let's break that down. If bad things happen to you, you must have done something to deserve it. Karma, right? Cosmic justice. There's no one to blame but yourself. And if we don't believe this, and yet even good Presbyterians will find themselves thinking, what did I do? Or what did I do to deserve this? We desperately want to believe in cause and effect, that something must have happened in order for something else to happen. If you do this and this will happen, good bears good, bad bears bad, but that is not how the world works. Want an example of that? Jesus is a very good man. And he died a cruel death. So that was option one. Option two is blame other people. In our stress and in our anxiety, we look for people to blame. There's a deadly virus that originated in China. So what happens on the streets of, of the United States, there are hate crimes against Asian Americans looking for someone or something to blame. What do I do with this anxiety? What do I do with the stress? What do I do with my fear? Gotta blame somebody. The first hate crime after 9-11 was against a, a man uh, from, from the Sikh religion. I was raised to believe it was pronounced Sikh, but I know someone from this religion and it's pronounced Sikh. I understand why we changed it, but it, from the sick of the first man who was killed because he wore a turban. What do I do with my fear? What do I do with my, you know, I don't like this. There's got to be somebody to blame. So we blame it on other people. At the root of it, I'm afraid. And I don't know what to do with my fear. This goes on all the time. Analyze the world. Analyze the news through that lens. How are people afraid and what are they doing with, this, with their fear? My life is not the way I want it to be. It shouldn't be this way. Who's at fault? Who can I get mad at? That's the second option. And finally, the third alternative is to disavow God. That when tragedy strikes in, in our lives, you know, for some people, their faith goes out the window. I remember a woman saying to me, when my husband got his diagnosis, that was it. I wanted nothing to do with God. And we have to be very, very careful what we say to folks because we try to make sense of things and we can't know. We can't know. Um, I'll let you in on a little secret. And, and, I, and I'll never say no to when at, at funerals, when people want to uh, invite people to, to share the stories. Eulogy, the, the root of that word means a, like a good word or a good story. And you, as pastor, you really wish that people would just come up and tell good stories. But every once in a while, somebody stands up and wants to make sense of the death for everyone. And then you sit, you know, and you won't, hopefully you will never see it on my face, but inwardly cringe, cringe, cringe. Bad theology. God needed another angel. Mm -hmm. 
I had a father one time told me a pastor did this, and I'm sure she learned her lesson uh, over the years. But she said to his, his wife had died young, had two young children, and said to the kids, God needed another angel. He left the church like that. God needed an angel more than my kids needed a mom. We got to be careful. We don't know. In all humility, we don't know. We can't know. And, and you may be comfortable with the theology that, that makes sense to you, but we're all different. I had a, a roommate in seminary who lost her father at 16, and she had to believe that God had a reason for it. And, that, and that's, she, she would live and die on that. There had to have been a reason for it. But I'll tell you as a pastor, I cannot, I'm looking around the room, I cannot tell a woman who's been violated that it was God's will. I cannot tell somebody who was abused as a child that, that, would, that there's a reason for it. I can tell them that there's a God who's going to see them through it. I can tell them that there's a God for whom there's healing. But I can't try to make sense of it for them. We can't know. We don't know. And the book of Job highlights the question, why do bad things happen to good people? But it doesn't answer the question. The book of Job asks the question, will you follow God, believe in God, love God, whether you have everything or whether you have nothing? The, test, the text asks us, do we, do we want it to be quid pro quo? Or is it going to be a relationship? A relationship with God through the ups and the downs. I want to give, or let's give space to each other the, to, throw, to throw the honest tantrum, you know, to be able to say, really, Lord, why? But know that every time that we shout out to God, why? The answer is, I'm with you. And our faith, our stories of faith, faith speak to a God who helps us find healing no matter what happens to us. Job finds love again. His fortune is re restored. It's a totally unsatisfactory ending, ending for modern years. We're just like, but he's, you, you killed his family. How is, you know, uh, but it, remember, it's not, it's a story. It's not a documentary, right? In God, we find healing and peace and, rest, and restoration and resurrection if we turn to God rather than away. That is our uni universal story. Today, there are children of God all over the planet celebrating this meal. That reminds us that God is with us, that God would do anything, anything to let us know that. To let us know that nothing can separate us from the love of God. And I was trying to think of all the different circumstances where people are celebrating this meal. Some may be uh, celebrating communion in secret. Some people may not have anything for bread or wine. Some will celebrate with the sounds of birds in the background. Others will, sound, will celebrate with the sound of gunfire in the background. From refugee camps to cathedrals, we celebrate the love of God made known in Jesus Christ who is, who was, who will always be, who gets us out of bed in the morning to help a hurting world and to find healing ourselves. At this table, we tell Jesus' story, but he's also telling our story, how we find wholeness from brokenness, fulfillment as we pour ourselves out for the world, forgiveness, salvation, new life with God. I want to finish with this encouragement to tell your stories. Tell your stories of faith and struggle and certainty and doubt. Tell your friends, tell your children how faith has made a difference in your life. Tell them how you, how you have seen God at work and don't pretend to know all the answers. Job's story, our stories are not systematic theology. We're not going to reason anybody into faith, but you may open the door of possibility 
by telling your true story about how God has brought new life into your life. People are worried uh, whether the church is going to survive. I don't. The institutional church is going to change. That I'm pretty sure of. But the spirit of God is alive and well and at work in this world, writing new stories in your life and my life and in the lives of our children and our children's children and, and, and so on and so on. The story of Jesus and, and how the story affects our story are stories worth telling. When the world questions with all the bad stuff going on in the world, how do you still believe in God? Don't try to explain. Just the answer, let me tell you a story. And then tell them your story. The story that keeps you coming to this table. Because you know that you need Jesus for the living of these days. In Jesus' name, amen.